In the name of the living God, who is blessed Trinity. Amen. There are certain words or phrases that I think only make sense in certain geographical contexts. Here's what I mean. Uh, When my family left Oklahoma near the end of high school, we moved back to California. And so we spent uh, elementary, junior high, and most of high school in Oklahoma. So when we got back to California... And uh, it would be something like if you were getting ready to do something. I said, well, I'm fixing to do this. And they would look at me going, what in the world does that mean you're fixing to do something? Or if you were going to take somebody to a store or take them to a restaurant, I'm going to let me carry you to the store. And again, people going, really, how are you going to literally carry this person to a store? These phrases didn't quite work across context. And yet I think there are some phrases that do have the same meaning as across context. For instance, trying to keep up with the Joneses. That's an unfortunate phrase if your last name is Jones. Because I've never heard anybody talk about trying to keep up with the Peavy houses. But keeping up with the Joneses, it's a phrase that seems to speak of comparison, right? The Joneses, or whatever family that is for you, they have everything. Or so you seem. So they have everything you don't. We have to get what they have. It's probably a little bit of envy. We can't really celebrate their accomplishment because we have to have that. And if we have to have what they have, it probably reveals a bit of a lack of contentment on our part. Now, we're all good people, so we don't possibly live like this. We can't possibly admit that this is how we live our lives. But I wonder, when no one is looking, And in the dark parts of our own lives, we try to keep up with the Joneses, whoever that might be for us. So keep that in mind. In our gospel lesson that we just heard from Mark's ninth chapter, on two occasions in this small reading, the disciples are silent in response to Jesus. The first time... Jesus makes yet another passion prediction. He talks about his coming crucifixion and resurrection. And it says they did not understand and were afraid to ask. That was a line I took a lot of times in class. I for sure didn't want to raise my hand for fear that I revealed how much I didn't know. And then after they had gotten to the house they were going to, Jesus asks that loaded question. What were you all talking about on the way? And it says they were silent because they were arguing, and it wasn't a good kind of conversation. In the midst of this, hearing about the passion prediction and arguing amongst themselves, has me wondering, what is it about Jesus? What is it about his message, the way of life that he offers that's so difficult to understand and fully grasp? And I don't think it's just the disciples back in Jesus' time that had a problem. I think this is a problem for us today. Fully taking in what Jesus is talking about and living into the implications of Jesus' way of life. And so the disciples, the culture was very hierarchical. So prestige and power was important. It was important to have a high position in society. When I think about it, I'm not for sure our culture is all that much different today. Remember, might is right. Or supposedly, if you're the strongest, you're the best. Wealth seems to be everything. And the stranger, whoever that is defined as, 
Somebody that's different, sounds different, looks different, comes from a different place. The kind of phrase where we've used, your people aren't my people, or I don't know your people. The stranger is always dangerous, or at the very least, suspicious. I think that's kind of the culture we live and breathe in. And so we find that Jesus coming along in this lesson, and really throughout the gospel, I think, not living into what the disciples then and us as disciples today think Jesus should be. Jesus doesn't meet our expectations. They wanted somebody that could charge in and get on a white horse and charge to Rome and defeat Rome so they could be free. But Jesus starts talking. And he says, the first must be last. You must learn to be a servant of all. Now, somebody that is supposed to be all-powerful, that can defeat any rival, doesn't talk about being a servant. And to fully emphasize this, uh, imagine as we're, we're walking through this story, the disciples are in this house, and somehow this little kid shows up. And so Jesus grabs this little child, sends him right in the middle, and makes such a powerful object lesson. And I don't think Jesus picked this child up because there was a sense in which the little kids were all so cute, kind of like those old precious memory figurines that you wanted to have up on yourself. And they always looked so nice. But when they broke, there was no possible way to super glue them back. But the babies were so cute. Jesus, I think, is grabbing a child because a child in his world I think, was a non-entity. It had no bearing. It had no identity apart from being attached to somebody. A child in Jesus' day was someone that lived on the margin. They didn't really count. And this is the very person Jesus brings into their midst and says, this is who you should welcome. This is what following me looks like. And if you welcome this one, when you welcome somebody on the margin, when you welcome those that we would rather leave out on the outskirts inside, We're not only welcoming Jesus, we're welcoming the one that sent him. So Jesus is not trying to take that culture and make it better. Jesus is offering a completely different way to look at life. Because in his world, in our world, if you give up your space for someone else, it doesn't work out well for you. Just imagine when the next iPhone comes out and you're told at this time they'll be released. Now, if you're willing to get out of bed at 5, 30, 6 o'clock to get your place in line, you probably are not going to see someone that wanders in at 9 say, well, just come on up and take my spot. It's not that big of a deal. Or in our world where scarcity seems to be the way of life, there's never enough. So we've got to hoard onto what we have. And anybody on the margins is possibly going to take what we have. Jesus offers a different vision. Jesus offers this idea of servant leadership as our witness to the world. That the first is last. The greatest is the one that really serves. The poor most often teaches the rich. And this strange turn of phrase that somehow to find your life, you lose it for my sake. Or in the language we just talked about, Jesus says, don't keep up with the Joneses. Don't try to have more than the Joneses. Don't try to have less. Don't live by that way of measuring your life. Live by what Jesus offers. 
Now, that shouldn't seem easy to any of us because I don't think that is our culture. And so we need the grace of God to move in that direction. Because there's stuff that's happening all around us. There is darkness. We do look around and see a lot of death. And it's so very tempting and easy to look around and see all the death and darkness in our lives and to think that's all that there is. But the way of Jesus, the way of the cross, the way of being a servant to all is looking out, not ignoring the death and the darkness, but any time that we see death, is always an opportunity for Jesus to bring about resurrection. 